No, he's made sure. He's listened to the arguments from his friends, listened to the arguments from Job, and he knows Job, the situation. He knows this, the, 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 uh, Job's life and his own uh, uh, dealings in the community, no doubt. But he says, My word shall be of the uprightness of my heart, and my lips shall utter knowledge clearly. He wanted to make sure he had all the facts straight, and he relied on God to give him the proper words to speak. That's Elihu. Different than uh, Eliphaz and Bildad and the other fella. <laughs> And this is the same preparation as, as we see here in, in Elihu's uh, speech. This is the same preparation that any preacher should take uh, and use before, his step, um, before he steps into a pulpit and preaches God's word. Uh, we ought to be very careful. Proverbs 8 and verse 8 says, All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing forward or perverse in them. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, Paul said, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God, that's, that's important, as we were allowed of God, God allows this thing to go on. God, as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, uh, you, you know, there's a fine line between preaching the Word of God in truth and in love, amen, and in, in the right spirit, wanting to help people, not just trying to cut them to death and kill them and, 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 and beat them to death, but at the same time, not trying to please them either. As we said, I think it was last week, there's, you know, there's, there's times in... Um, and not last week, last time, last month. Um, there's times when in a, in a larger, in a large crowd, when there may be people of influence, people that may have, you know, the bucks, that a preacher might be tempted to, to kind of ease back on his preaching a little bit, not wanting to affect the income. And Paul said, uh, no, we've been entrusted with the gospel. And regardless of what it, it, how it pleases man, we know that it will help man. It's going to save man. It's the power of God unto salvation. And we know that men, for the most part, unless they're born again, or unless they're seeking God, have no desire to hear truth. And they're not going to be pleased with it when you preach it. There's no desire in this world to hear truth. That's why they hated Christ. They hated him and they put him on a cross. And he told his disciples and he told us, they hated me, they're going to hate you. And so while we have to be careful, we may got to make sure we're doing it with the right spirit as Elihu. And we're, 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 we've got uh, God's uh, agenda in, in mind and not our own. At the same time, we've got to make sure that we are preaching to please God and not man. Paul goes on to say, but God, which trieth our hearts. So we're, our preaching is not, was not of deceit, he said. Our exhortation was not of deceit. He wasn't just trying to uh, deceive someone into getting saved. Sometimes uh, you listen to some of the preaching on the radio and, and, and the people, are these, these preachers, and you, and you know why they're doing it. They're trying to make, make uh, Christianity sound like it's a bed of roses and there's going to be no, no, uh, no, no fight, no friction. There's going to be no uh, harm done after you're saved and you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise if you just put faith in Christ. And, and that's not the way it is. And they try to deceive people into coming to Christ. That's not, that's not Scripture. God wants us to just preach the book, preach the gospel, lay it out there on the line, and it's up to him and the hearer to do business. Not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. So Elihu, 
he goes on to say in verse 4 of Job chapter 33, The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. Here's another verse that uh, really describes the inspiration of God, defines what the inspiration of God is. It's God breathing His breath into the life of an individual. We talked in in depth about that in the previous chapter. Look at chapter 32 and verse 8. Again, Job, uh, Elihu says, But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. And you couple that with verse 4, The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. You'll get a good understanding of what inspiration is, and how God inspired this book, and how it is still, still, to this day, the inspired Word of God. Because the breath of God gives it life. Somebody said, well, that book is just ink and on, on paper. <laughs> yeah, but the word's in it. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, and we have them. If you don't have them, then, then you're in trouble. How are you going to live? You say, well, we got, uh, you know, the best translation. Well, we got, you know, the closest to the original. How do you know? you never seen the original. You never put your eyes on it. Your professor's never put his eyes on it. Uh, so you're, you're putting faith in something. <laughs> you might as well put your faith in what God has given us and what God has used, amen, to, to, to birth this nation, to spread the gospel around the world like never before. Uh, this, is, this is what God's got his hand on. Believe it. Uh, we talked, um, the other day we were talking about worship and, and uh, how we, you know, we enjoy uh, especially during times like the beggars meeting or other meetings or, you know, when, a, when God really moves in on a service and we enjoy worshiping God, you know, in, in excitement and enthusiasm. But part of worshiping God, according to Scripture, is just believing His Word. He gets worshiped by us picking up His Word and Him speaking to us and we just say, <clears throat> say yes, Lord, I believe it. Whether we like it or not, we believe it. That's worshiping God. Elihu goes on in verse 5, If thou canst answer me, set thy words in order before me, stand up. Behold, I am according to thy wish in God's stead. <coughs> Excuse me. I also am formed out of the clay. Behold, my terror shall not make thee afraid, neither shall my hand be heavy upon thee. Elihu challenges Job to defend himself. I don't, know, I don't know about you. If somebody uh, came up to you, young uh, you, you guys, and in, in here, you ladies may not understand this, but uh, if somebody came up to you and said, uh, "You know, come on, uh, stand up like a man and answer me," you're gonna, that's that's a challenge. That's you know, somebody you know putting it out there, and that's what Elihu is doing with Job. If thou can, canst answer me, set thy words in order before me. Make sure you think about what you're getting ready to say and stand up and answer me. He says, Behold, I am according to thy wish in God's stead. I also am formed out of the clay. He reminds Job here that Job had cried out for someone to be the arbitrator between he and God. Look back in Job chapter 9. Job chapter 9. And Job, as he cried out, as he was suffering, trying to understand what God was doing with him, made this <clears throat> this plea, or this statement, rather. If you back up to ver- chapter 9, look at, verse, um, look at verse 32. For he, speaking of God, is not a man, as I am, that I should answer him. And we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. That daysman is the idea of someone being a a go-between, an arbitrator, 
if you will, of, uh, of two parties that are at odds. And Job feels that obviously he's at odds with God because of what God's doing to him. And he says there, and God is, you know, God is not a man. It's, it's not like I can just go up to God, you know, and, 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 you know, punch him in the nose. Or, or, you know, give my, my two cents worth. He said he's not a man, but, uh, and he, he said, and there's no daysman between us. There's nobody here that's uh, trying to, to get this thing settled. It's, I got three guys that are trying to crucify me. But Elihu reminds Job that, uh, that he made that statement, and yet here he is. He says, I am according to thy wish in God's stead. I also am formed out of the clay. He says, I am a man. I am a man, just like you, Job. And God has sent me here to be an arbitrator in representation of him. God did not come down. This time, obviously, Jesus Christ wasn't around. And at this moment in time, God did not show himself to mankind like he did Moses later on in Scripture. In, in, a the, in a theophany of some sort. And we'll see that in the next few verses, how God dealt with man at this time prior to the law, prior to, uh, to the nation of Israel. And so he says, but uh, here I am. God has sent me. I am the, uh, the, the daysman, as you were looking for. And obviously, we know that uh, Job, what he longed for is what we have in Christ. We do have a daysman. Amen. We do have an arbitrator, the, the, the mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. However, he also lets Job know that he understands his own humanity. Even though he says, I'm here in God's stead, and like any preacher should understand that they, when they are, are representing God, they need to understand also their own humanity, their own limitations, and Elihu lets Job know that he understands that. He knows that he's only a man. And he has, no outside of the authority of God, outside of the word of God, he has no right to be accusing Job of anything. But he's not there under his own, his own idea, his own agenda. He's there because God wants him to be there. And he tries to soften the blow by letting him know that he means him no harm, he says in verse 7, Behold, my terror shall not make thee afraid. Neither shall my hand be heavy upon thee. These other three guys were had no concern for uh, Job's feelings. <laughs> not, that, not that we should, but these guys definitely didn't. They, he, they had no concern. They didn't, they didn't care how Job felt about what they were saying. Uh, and it showed. And but Elihu is letting him know that listen, it's getting ready to it's getting ready to get pretty rough. What I got to say, God's given it to me. I can't help it. <laughs> but I mean, you no harm, really, Job. There's nothing here that I'm trying to do to 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 make matters worse. I'm not trying to to make the situation worse. We I, we understand that you've been devastated. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, you know, almost like the, the, the Philippian jailer. I mean, when he realized what was going on and he was going to end his life, Paul said, do thyself no harm. Amen. We, this, is, this, this whole thing that's happened, this, God breaking us out of this jail when we haven't even escaped is, is for your good. It's to waking you up. But Elihu is letting him know that he means him no harm and that the harshness of his rebuke is only meant to wake him up and ultimately restore him. That's the goal. When somebody uh, messes up, amen, uh, we need to be blunt and, and, and harsh and rebuke, as Paul says, with all authority. But the idea behind it is not just to, to make them while they will feel bad, that's natural, they've sinned. The, the, the problem with today's society is that nobody wants anybody to feel guilty. 
Nobody wants anybody to feel any sort of uh, uh, sorrow or grief for, for anything wrong they've done. And so everybody tries to tiptoe around the, the tulips and the situation because of someone's feelings. Well, sometimes you've got to not worry about the feelings. But the goal, what people don't understand, is that the rebuke from the Word of God is meant to restore the individual. Not just to kill them. God will take care of that. If, if they don't get right and, 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 and they go too far, God will deal with them in that manner. He's got us here to restore, the Bible, Paul said, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. He told Timothy, rebuke and, and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no man despise thee. But it's to help people. To get them to understand where they are and what they've done so that they can come back. So Elihu, as, as our Savior, uh, is meant to be an advocate of some sort to try to get the situation remedy, remedied. And he says, the Bible says in 1 John 2, 1, My little children... These things write I unto you that you sin not. That's, that's the goal. I know we're not sinless in our flesh. There's, we can't, there's no sinless perfection. But we have Christ's righteousness in us. And the goal, our goal every day should be to wake up and say, Okay, Lord, with your power, with your strength, with your righteousness, I'll not blow it this, today. And we have to do that every day. We have to do that every hour, it seems like, sometime. But that's the goal. John said, listen, I'm writing to you that you don't sin. But if you do, <laughs> he says, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. All right, and that, that thought, that truth is not to make us say, well, <laughs> well, great, I got an advocate. <laughs> we can just uh, have ourselves a time. No, we, got, we can't forget the first part. The goal, amen, is to not grieve the Holy Spirit, not to sin, amen, but thank God if we do, when we, when we do cease to walk in the Spirit, when we do cease to, 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 to put our faith and trust in, in how we got saved and the same God that saved us that'll, that'll keep us, we do have an advocate with the Father. And if we didn't, we'd have to get saved every time we sinned. We'd have to call out to God again every time we sin, just like the Old Testament. They'd have to bring that lamb again. Amen. Shed its blood again. Why? Because the veil of the temple had not yet been tw uh, rent twain. But we have an advocate with the Father. Amen. We, we've, uh, we've got much more in Christ than what Job had. Look at Job chapter 33 and verse 8. Elihu says, Surely thou hast spoken in mine hearing. All right, here's the crux of the matter. <laughs> thou hast spoken in my hearing, and I have heard the voice of thy words. And listen, Job, I've heard you say it from your own mouth. This is, this is what's going on. This is the problem. Forget about what all these guys have said and how you're, you know, some criminal. Forget about all that. This is the problem. Verse 9. Job said, I am clean without transgression. I am innocent. Neither is there iniquity in me. Now, Job never said that verbatim, word for word, but he sure enough implied it. Now we know in this situation, from the beginning of the book of Job, when, when, when God had this, this conversation with the devil, and all the things that happened to Job did not happen to Job because of something he had done. Right? I mean, God isn't punishing Job for 
being a you know embezzler. He's not punishing Job for being a murderer. He's not punishing Job, uh, you know, for for being a bad father. He's not punishing Job for being some wicked individual like these three gentlemen think he, they, that he is. As we said, there's multiple things that God is doing in the life of Job, and he's accomplishing many things. He's, he's teaching the devil a lesson. Amen. He's teaching these three, th- three guys and all of us a lesson, and he's teaching Job something. And what he's teaching Job and what he's trying to do with Job, here in one verse, Elihu sums up Job's estimation of himself. In one verse, he says, Job, this is what you think of yourself. And Job, and finally, Job is confronted with the truth of the matter that although the events surrounding his latter days have nothing to do with any iniquity that he has been involved in, but God is personally dealing with Job in the matter of his own self righteousness. His own self righteousness. That's what that's the what God is trying to teach Job. And although, again, Job did not say uh, these words in verse 9 verbatim, he did strongly imply it. Look at Job chapter 9 and verse 17. Job chapter 9 and verse 17. Job says, For he breaketh me, speaking of God, with a tempest, and multiplieth my wounds... Without cause. Again, Job never did curse God. But he sure questioned him. And he sure accused him. He never cursed him. Amen. God won that battle with the devil. The devil said, he's going to you touch him and you allow me to touch him. He's going to curse you to your face. And Job's wife even tried to help in that matter. And so... Here he's accusing God of inflicting him without cause. Look at chapter 10 and verse 7. Job chapter 10 and verse 7. He says, Thou knowest that I am not wicked, and there is none that can deliver out of thine hand. He says, God, you know that I'm not a wicked man. Look at chapter 11 and verse 4. For thou hast said... This is one of the three gentlemen reiterating to Job something that he said. Obviously not verbatim or not recorded anyway. My doctrine is pure, and I am clean in thine eyes. You say, well, Job was right. (laughs) Or was he? Notice what, in all these verses, what's the the key word? I, me, mine. Look at chapter 16, Job chapter 16. Job chapter 16, come down to verse... Uh, Look at verse 16. He says, My face is foul with weeping on my eyelids as a shadow of death. Not for any injustice in mine hands. Also, my prayer is pure. Job is not only trying to defend himself. He's not only just trying to say that, you know, these events aren't because of something I've done, which he would be right in that. He's going a little far in his estimation of himself. Look at chapter 23, Job chapter 23. Job chapter 23. I mean, verse 10 is a good verse. We we use this verse, amen? He says, but he knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. It's almost like Job has got that uh, dual nature going on, that, that, you know, uh, multiple personality. 
He knows that, and it seems seemingly in this verse, that God is trying him and he's going to come out in this thing. But then verse 11, my foot hath held his steps. His way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And that all may be true in a sense. And while we should understand as a Christian what we should learn from this, as a Christian, the doctrine of our standing. Our standing in Christ. And every born-again child of God needs to learn that. And one of the problems with our churches is that they're not teaching that. And that's why people get so confused with their salvation and they, 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 they go out and they blow it and, they, and then the, 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 the grieving of the Holy Spirit, they're not taught that the Holy Spirit can be grieved and, and that he can, He's got feelings and, he, he, he's, and that affects them because He's inside them. And they're not taught that they have the dual nature, that they're saved and they're, 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 God has performed an operation that has severed their soul from this flesh. Amen. And that new man on the inside has a desire to serve God and wants to serve God and is perfect. But this flesh is still alive and we have to reckon it dead, but it's still here. We have to count it dead. And they, they, they bring them in, put them in the water, baptize them, dunk them, and then, and then you know, send them back for candy and cake and cookies and, and never teach them anything from the Word of God. And they grow up and they, and they sin and they, and they grieve the Holy Spirit of God and they come back to church and get saved again. Over and over and over again. Why? Because they have no idea that their standing in Christ is fixed and it cannot be affected by anything they do. And while we need to understand that, I, at the same time, we must be careful not to claim any righteousness of our own and boast in ourselves. We need to understand the, the doctrine of our standing in Christ and what we have in Christ and help others to understand it. But be careful. Not to take it too far. Be careful not to uh, uh, take it to the extreme to where uh, you think that anything you do, whether it's right or wrong, is acceptable to God. It is not. The truth that our standing is in Christ does not give us the liberty to allow our walk to be in and of the flesh. Our, our liberty that we have in Christ is not an excuse to sin. A lot of times, Baptists are accused of that. You know, they, we, we're accused of, because we teach eternal security, that a, that a child of God, is once they're saved, they're saved forever. There's nothing that's going to ever change that. And we get accused of saying, well, you guys give people a license to sin. No, that's not what we give them at all. If we would read our Bible, if they would just read their Bible, they'd understand that they don't have a license to sin. But there are some in this day and age, in the modern Christianity, in this mega church movement, in this you know uh, touchy feely Christianity, that are pushing that. That God could care less what you do. He's all love and He's all grace, and there's it doesn't matter how you live in the flesh, and that's hogwash. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Paul that wrote the whole letter refuting uh, the, the pharisaical movement that was coming into the church. Teaching people that they had to do works in addition to their salvation to stay saved. Teaching people that they had to be circumcised and keep the law. And that would ensure that their, their entrance into heaven. While Paul had to refute that, he also had to balance that, that refutation with this, this statement. In, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. For brethren, Paul says, ye have been called under liberty. Right? He says you've been given liberty. Uh, you're not, uh, your liberty is in Christ. Your liberty is you're free from heaven to keep the law. To earn salvation. You, do, you no longer have to worry about um, uh, 
you know, going out on the Sabbath and picking up sticks. No one's going to stone you. You've been called under liberty. And Paul knew what that teaching would do if it was taken the wrong way, if it was taken to the extreme. And it's evident because it has been. Not only in Paul's day, but still in our day. He finishes that verse. He says, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Paul knew and he prophesied that there would be those that took that liberty and used it as an occasion to the flesh, to sin. To do something that this flesh longed to do, that wanted it, that it just had a desire to do. And knowing that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God, we're saved for eternity, what's a little, you know, what's a little, little sin going to do? You know, what's a little drink here and there going to do? What's a little, you know, puff on a joint going to do? You say that's not happening. <laughs> it's happening. And I guarantee you out in Colorado, there's a lot of churches with a lot of liberty probably that are taking their liberty. You say, well, doesn't that make us Pharisees if we preach against that stuff? No, 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 no. We've already preached that here. I'm not going to reiterate that whole message again. But a Pharisee is not someone that takes truth from the Word of God and warns people to stay away from sin. It's the Pharisee that doesn't think he's got a problem, that he isn't capable of sin. That's the Pharisee. Elihu here in our text, and then we as well, need to, as Elihu does, need to understand that as much as we warn people and preach and rebuke, that we've got to consider ourselves that we are capable of falling into the same trap. So Paul says, don't use your liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Don't use the fact that you're going to heaven and there's nothing that could change that to purposefully go out there and, 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 and live in sin. Don't do it. Paul warned us against it. And you say, well, well what's, what, what are the repercussions if we do, Paul? So what? What are you going to do? We're, we've, we're safe forever. He warned us that although this body is going to die, and it's going to go to the ground, and until God raptures us and changes it, it's the temple of the Holy Ghost right now. And he said, if any man defile the temple, and that's the flesh, the body, we defile it, him shall the devil destroy. That's not what he said. Him shall who destroy? God. He said, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. And so the liberty that we have in Christ is not to, to take that liberty and, and take advantage of salvation and live how we want to live. The truth that our standing is in Christ does not give us liberty to allow our walk to be in and of the flesh. There's when we, we, we preach rightly dividing, we teach, I should say, we teach rightly dividing. When we talk about rightly dividing, it's not just about dispensations. It's not just about the gap. It's not just about, you know, things that are not necessarily conducive to salvation necessarily, but things that we need to know so we don't get hooked and messed up with the, these cults and, and, you know, false teachers. But at the same time, we have to rightly divide the, tr the, the, the doctrines that Paul taught, teaches. He teaches about our standing in Christ. There's a difference between standing and walking. Would you not agree? Standing is like this. Amen? Walking is like this. <laughs> There's a difference. If I tell my son to stand there and he starts walking around, he's going to get a spanking. 
if I tell him to go walk over there and he just stands there, there's going to be a problem. There's a difference between standing and walking. When Paul, look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. While you're turning there, when Paul, all, he, he all the time teaches us that we need to be careful with our walk. What, is he, what did he tell us? Walk in the Spirit and you what? Not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Our standing, again, is in Christ. It's fixed. It doesn't move. When someone's standing, they're not moving. Right? Your standing is, is fixed forever. But there's a, another teaching of the Apostle Paul that deals with a Christian's walk. And when you're walking, you're moving. You're taking steps. You're going forward. And in the midst of all that, that our walk affects not our salvation, not our eternal destiny. Number one, it affects our fellowship with God. Your walk. Your standing's fixed. You're a son. Nothing's going to change. But that fellowship with the Father is affected by our walk down here. We're seated. Another difference with Christ in heavenly places. Right? That's, that's, that's your, your uh, position in Christ, in eternity, you're already there. Again, as we see it in Revelation, we're there singing in the choir. That's an eternity. Right now, we're still in this realm of time. Right? If you're not, then then we're scared right now because you're here like we can see you. And if you're not here, then you're somewhere else, And but you're here. Anyway, in time, down here on planet Earth, as a Christian is walking, they don't not only affect their fellowship with God, they affect their fellowship with the church, and their influence to the world. If your walk gets messed up, you're going to be out of fellowship with God, you're going to be out of fellowship with the local church, and you're going to affect the world in a negative way. Because you profess Christ, you profess that you are uh, a, an heir of God, an ambassador for Jesus Christ, and if we mess up, the world's going to notice it and take note of it, and people could die and go to hell because of it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, I'm in 2 Corinthians, so I'll catch up with you here in a second. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm running out of time, so let me read these verses real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, look at verse 9. Paul says, but take heed, the whole verse, chapter, he's talking about the liberty that we have, that he has in Christ. And, you know, nobody can tell me what to eat. And, amen, Peter was told to eat fish and crab legs and praise the Lord and all that good stuff. But he, he always prefaced it or, or followed it up with, I should say, take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours, which you have, it's in Christ, it's yours, that it becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak. Amen. I can eat bacon all day long. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm not even going to get a t-shirt that says bacon. Another reason I know Jesus loves me. But I wouldn't wear that shirt. Amen. If I was trying to win my Jewish friend to the Lord. Right? Or if someone that just got saved that hasn't understood that doctrine yet that that we have liberty in Christ and the, the things under the law don't affect us in a spiritual way like they did the people in the Old Testament. I'm not going to go flaunt it just to, 
to make them understand that. I'm going to try to teach them that first, and then we're going to go to Tony's and have a bunch of bacon. We're not, it's not, the idea is not to, just because you have liberty, not to offend someone just because of that. Now, if they get offended and you're not trying to do it and, and they get offended, then that's their problem. But when we set out to do it on purpose, that's a different spirit. Paul says, don't do that. Don't do that. First Peter chapter 2, a couple more verses. First Peter chapter 2. I just want to finish this up. I've got a few minutes before service. First Peter chapter 2. Look at verse 16. Peter also taught. Look at verse look at verse 15. For so is the will of God that with well doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free Amen. We're free in Christ. And we ought to enjoy that. We ought to uh, relish that. And we ought to praise God for it. In our relationship with God. But when it comes to relationships out here, he says as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness. Don't use it to just to try to destroy somebody. Because you're a fool if you do. But as a servants of God. Look at Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2. Verse 19. Speaking of these false teachers, and there's a bunch of them around. I mean, there's a... And they got a lot of good stuff. I'm telling you, they got a lot of good things. Make people, uh, you know, draw, that are drawn to, seemingly drawn to Christ. But man, when they get them in, they destroy them. And while they promise them liberty... They promise them liberty. They themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. So you can boast in your liberty and destroy somebody with it and be yourself put in back into bondage. And that's a dangerous thing. And Elihu, is, he's, he is very careful. He says, listen, I'm not trying to destroy you, Job. I want to help you, but your problem is you think you're, while you're not, while you're innocent of any charges against you for, specifically for this issue and for these events that have happened to you, you're not sinless. And our problem is that we, when we start uh, going around and flaunting the fact that we are perfect in Christ, now, when you're teaching somebody about their standing in Christ, that's another thing. But when we go around and trying to use our liberty, as, as Peter said, as a cloak of maliciousness and just trying to, to offend people with our liberty, we've got a problem. We've got a problem. And the Bible's against it. And he says, Job, listen, I understand. We just, just be careful when you start defending yourself. You may not be guilty of something you get sick or you get in a car accident or you something bad happens in your life and, and people start talking. Well, I knew that was going to happen to them. Or somebody comes to you and says, yeah, the reason this happened is because you're living in sin and you know that that's not really the case. And God's just trying you. He's just putting you through something. Don't, as Job, start going off and saying how righteous you are. Because in the truth of the matter, in that event, you might have been. But in a, as a whole, we are in the flesh, wicked as hell. Our heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And you have that old nature still that cl that's clinging to you. And that's why Paul says we have to reckon it to be dead. All right, we're out of time. You're just